Council is ready. The next case is Sundance versus Remark. And Mr. Grothy, you may proceed. May it please the court, counsel. My name is Brad Grothy and I represent Sundance Land Company. This case represents a case of uh, a question of first impression in the state of Iowa. And the question is this, what effect does ownership on both sides of a purported line by the same party have on a claim for boundary by acquiescence in Iowa? In this case, the 80 acres owned by Sundance Land Company or the Sundance real estate, and the adjoining real estate to the south, the, the Remark real estate owned by Mr. and Mrs. Remark, were owned by the same party for three years. Mr. and Miss, uh, Mrs. Hubble uh, purchased the Remark real estate on June 29, 2005, and the Hubbles uh, purchased the Sundance real estate in 2014 and the Hubbles owned both properties from May 9th, 2014 through April 18th, 2017, a period of almost three years. And before purchasing the Remark Real Estate and the Sundance Real Estate, Scott Hubble was in sole possession of both of these properties as a tenant dating back to April of 1995. And when you aggregate his tenancy, with his ownership, he was in sole possession of this property for over 22 years. The question in this case uh, uh, concerns uh, the boundary line between the two properties. Now Sundance, as owner of record title, is presumed under Iowa law to be the owner of the real estate as set forth in the legal description of record. And that's what Sundance is claiming that they hold title to the property pursuant to the government uh, section lines. The remarks claim the boundary is north of this line pursuant to the theory of boundary by acquiescence. I will quote. Okay, so did Sundance, they knew that the, there was a different boundary line, or at least the parties believe there was a different boundary line, which is why they had it surveyed. Is that right? They, uh, uh, they did some investigative work before they purchased it and found out that there were some encroachments over the section line, yes. But before they purchased it, they were aware, you call it an encroachment, uh, but at least historically there had been this line running along the road that the prior landowners had treated as a boundary. And that's why they investigated. Uh, uh, I believe that my client uh, stood at the end of the access road and looked up and had some questions, and then he commissioned a surveyor. He, didn't, he wasn't aware that there was maybe a boundary dispute, but he, he knew that as a result of the survey, there were some encroachments. Record, when your client did some investigation, they realized that the survey line, there were, there were there, were, there was this shed and, the, and this, um, uh, this other structure that seemed to be encroaching, and they were aware there was a problem, and that was confirmed by the survey. And then isn't the record that your client said, well, we'll buy it, and then we'll see what we can work out. Is that basically the record? Let me kind of try and move this up a, a little ahead. Um, you know, from my research, I find, all the, all the case law in the other jurisdictions is with you. The treatise, the only treatise in the area, the Smith and Cohan Law of Neighbors or whatever it is, is with you. What I need some help with is the statute. So help me, help explain to me why the statute doesn't, uh, doesn't allow, you know, the, the in effect, the, uh, uh, remarks to go and reach back to an older period of time and say, well, there was this boundary 
prior to the common ownership, and therefore that be, that's a boundary by acquiescence. I believe the statute that you're referring to is 650.14, uh, which provides. 650.14 and point six. those, I think it is, those are the two that I think govern this matter. Uh, 650.14 says that if it is found that the boundaries have been acquiesced, uh, those uh, such recognized boundaries and corners shall be permanently established. Um, and that is what the Court of Appeals and the trial court focused on. The lead case in this matter is Salazar versus Terry. It's a Colorado case. Right. And about out-of-state cases. I want to know about the statute. So. One could read that statute to say, if, if it is, it says, uh, I think you were quoting it correctly, if it, let me see if I can get the language in front of me, sorry. If it is found that the boundaries alle uh, alleged to have been recognized and acquiesced in 10 years have been recognized and acquiesced in, they shall be permanently established. One could read that to say that all it takes is any 10-year period of a boundary by acquiescence, it doesn't matter if you have had common ownership since then, there was a boundary that was recognized and acquiesced by, by two different parties. Um, so how do you answer that argument based on the statute? Based on the statute, uh, uh, I think that that, uh, that conclusion after there's been common ownership is very short-sighted and very problem problematic. Because what you're doing is if you purchase that property and uh, you own fee title to the property, what the, what the underlying uh, holdings say is that that property is subject to some unwritten servitude that somebody down the road may come in and say that a, a line totally within your property is a boundary line. And um, I think that that creates a permanent uh, uh, restriction on the alienation of property that you've bought and paid for. Go ahead. Go ahead. I, I, I want to, on, on that statute, um, I want to talk about the verb tense. <laughs> uh, so, as Justice Mansfield said, uh, the statute says, if it is found that the boundaries and corners alleged to have been recognized and acquiesced in for 10 years, have been so recognized. It doesn't say, so this is, this is present perfect tense, I think. It doesn't say had been recognized. It says have been, and I think have been suggests something started in the past, but there's some present connection to it. Am I right about that? Um. I guess I haven't really analyzed the, uh, the, the verbiage, but. Here's kind of with it. If, it. if it said had been recognized or had been acquiesced in, then it strikes me that if this was 100 years ago and it had been acquiesced in for 10 years, then uh, I think your client loses. But if, there's, if there has to be some present ongoing connection, some present ongoing tie to acquiescing in this, uh, in this boundary, then I, I would think that because your client owned it, uh, was sort of, you know, its own neighbor, uh, that, that there, there really isn't a path uh, because it hasn't been 10, 10 years yet. Okay. Um, I'm, I the verb tense used here, the have been acquiesced in distinction between the two verbs, had and have. Uh, if you, you know, I mean, the statute, you know, we, we may agree with what other jurisdictions have done, but we can't get there just because other jurisdictions do something. We may think that's good policy, not to, you know, what you're describing and the concerns that you raise. So, we need to hear a statutory argument as to why the statute uh, supports the outcome that you're advocating for. Statute uh, supports uh, uh, the uh, outcome. 
Um, um, <clears throat> Let me jump in. I'm, I'm going to carry. I'm going to try and pick up where, where Justice McDermott was. I think I, I'm following his drift. It sounds like maybe something actually had to have happened in the past to have to make it clear that that distinction was permanently established. Nobody tried to go to court or anything when there was uh, two separate ownerships, right? And there were just lines and, or a, I think a fence and a roadway or a railway, I can't remember, roadway. Um, but there's nothing that ever happened when those two owners, so then when the new owner comes along, is it your position that this statute allows a redo, start over? It's as if those lines were never drawn and it's back to the um, real estate? Well, my, it would be my uh, uh, statute, I mean, it would be my argument that when does the, when does the 10 year period run? For this claimant, Mr. Remark, um, and, uh, and I, would, I would indicate, I would uh, argue that it begins on April 18th, 2017, when this property was owned by two different parcels and you had the adjoining, you had adjoining landowners. Before that, you didn't have adjoining landowners. Pardon? In vout that the boundary by acquiescence is established independent of any transfer in court action, that once 10 years have passed, then the, it's done. Formal legal action after that. I think that's what we said in vout. I was a dissenter, but we just filed it. Uh, I, I, I did review that case, and I reviewed it uh, uh, quite extensively. But think of think of what this causes, uh, justices. Here's my question, though. Yeah. Didn't we just say this, though, what, two weeks ago? Uh, what do you think Vout says? I think Vout overrules here versus Thola, and says that uh, that you cannot. Uh, use the one-year statute of limitations in 614 print 5 to bar a claim of boundary by acquiescence. What was the rationale for that? And the rationale uh, for that is that uh, the, um, uh, the statute is established by the passage of 10 years and mutual recognition of it, regardless of court action and subsequent transfers? was that it wasn't, a boundary by acquiescence wasn't determined as an adverse claim to the title of the real estate, as I, as I read the opinion. But- Can I ask you about this? Older cases? Sure. So, I, I think you've said this is a case of first impression, but I have found a series of older cases that all deal with this exact issue of two people taking from a common grantor, um, where the common grantor had previously accepted a boundary. And the cases say that the person who comes second in time, which I think Sundance does, has no right to contest a boundary that's already been recognized. And that's particularly true where the first party has improvements on the property. So here we have two outbuildings, right, that are over the property line. If I'm right, I mean, you're, you don't cite the cases, but it seems like we have a lot of cases that already resolve this and say, first in time is first in right. I've been unable to find those cases. I, I would be glad to respond to them if you have, if you have uh, uh, a site uh, to it. Uh, uh, but in, in the cases that I've talked to that talk about common grantor, you have maybe people acquire it for, from a common grantor, and then after that, a 10-year period goes. And so uh, it's, uh, uh, again, this is, what you're doing is you're creating permanent restrictions on the alienation of property that have absolutely no time limit. Let me change the facts here in this situation. What if uh, Sundance, uh, or Mr. Hubble had agreed, I'm going to sell you uh, property, but I'm not gonna sell you the barn. And I'm gonna have a surveyor come out and I'm gonna survey that line off 10 feet from the south of the barn. 
And uh, we signed a contract to that. We had a survey uh, to that. We conveyed the property to that. Even after that, Mr. Remark, under the analysis of the, of the lower courts, could come back and say, regardless of what our transaction said, I now want that barn. Or what if Mr. Remark uh, owns, owns it for, yes? And though you just said that you, they changed the survey, right? And then they would have recorded that in the records. Boundary by acquiescence doesn't change what the deed says. It changes where the boundary actually is. And so when my understanding of the doctrine is that it doesn't change your title. What it changes is where the boundary is compared to the meets and bounds that are in the description. But in your example, they've actually moved, they've, they've changed the meets and bounds separately from what it was previously. And so I think that that's a very different situation. If So Mr. Hubble could have come in and said, and filed something in the, in the land records that said, I'm moving, I own both of these pieces of property, I'm gonna have them surveyed and I'm gonna move this line. But he has to file something um, to be able to do that and change it. So I think that that goes more to your, your hypothetical. My hypothetical is even if that was the case, Mr. Remark, after the transaction, even though he had agreed in the contract, accepted the deed, could still say, I own the barn. Or somebody down the road, Mr. Remark owns it for 20 years, then he conveys it to Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown could say, regardless of what you guys have agreed to in the past, I want the barn now. Um, and and land records that I'm only conveying the barn, then that the boundary by acquiescence just determines the boundary as of the time um, where the actual boundary is at the time of, of the acquiescence. And so if that line is changed, then the boundary no longer would apply because now you have established a, a completely separate boundary in the land records. Well, I, I, I still think that any party down the road could, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Brown comes 20 years after the remarks have owned it, he starts talking to the neighbors. That's where the boundary was based by an acquiescence 40 years ago. And under... Why, what, what is wrong with that? I mean... <laughs> If you, these older cases take a very practical, common sense approach to this. If you come to buy a piece of property and you see what everyone looks like a boundary line, because it's got a hedge and it's a road, and you see the neighbors built buildings over this area, then what's wrong with saying the subsequent purchaser should just have to take it in the way that everybody treats it, rather than forcing his southern neighbor to demolish or move a bunch of outbuildings that have been there? That seems a very commonsensical result. If you have notice of a problem, you just can't swoop in and take advantage of it and force your neighbors to tear down their building. Well, Your Honor, I would, I would say that, that the holdings of this court constitute permanent restrictions. Are, are landowners to uh, uh, any demarcation line lo located all within their property, do they have to preserve those? Are there heirs and devisees bound by those, regardless of how long they own the common property? Again, we're talking about a total internal boundary line here. Um, uh, uh, it, it, it's endless, the possibilities that, that could happen and the practical problems that could happen, none of which are of record, all of which uh, can be contrary to what people have done of record for years. This is a case of acquiescence built upon, um, oh, I'm sorry. So I'll let you take a seat and we will move on to the appellee. Mr. Goldsmith. May it please the court, counsel. My name is Brian Goldsmith. I'm gonna do my best to speak loudly. My voice is a little hoarse this morning. And uh, if you can't hear me, please tell me and I will try and speak louder. I represent Phil and Bobby Remark. 
Obviously, you're familiar with this case. It's an interesting case, and uh, the issue regarding uh, the joinder of, of the two parcels, I believe, is an issue of first impression, at least as it relates to the state of Iowa. But I believe that it is one that can be answered with some statutory interpretation, some review of our case law, and maybe, as was mentioned here, a little common sense. Iowa Code Section 65014 identifies that once a 10-year period of acquiescence is met, then a boundary by acquiescence is permanently established. I think that's a fair question. You know, the, the Ollinger case touches on that a little bit and says we don't look for repudiation or we don't look for acts of repudiation after. I was talking about repudiation by, you know, that's a situation where the person repudiates and then goes to court. I mean, that's, that's something that's happening in the present time. You don't get to leave, jump back 100 years, right? Sure, and, that, and, and that's why these are case by case fact right. so cases. I think, that, I think that's a factual consideration, and I think, again, on a case-by-case -case basis, the court and, and, and the trial court in this case is well-equipped to look at the facts, look at what occurred, and say, is this a boundary that was, was relied upon and, and was developed uh, by acquiescence over a period of 10 years or not? Rule, which I haven't found any exceptions to, is, is the notion of the common ownership to is that when there's common ownership, all of a sudden there isn't a boundary by acquiescence because it, the whole concept doesn't make any sense. You don't have two different property owners recognizing a boundary. You have property that's owned by one owner. And so the, that, that doctrine says, and it was like 15 days in the, in the Colorado case, that that cuts off any, anything that happened before, and then you have to reestablish the boundary by acquiescence. So, why, why doesn't that apply in, in Iowa? The dissent in that Colorado case really nailed it, and it was touched on a little bit here. And, and when you look at it as a whole, the concept of boundary by acquiescence, and as uh, Justin McDonald just said in, in the Vought case, you, you all just considered. Common ownership in Vought, though. But the concept is that once the 10-year period is run, then a new boundary line is established. And, and the way to think about it is you've got <clears throat> neighboring uh, boundary, you've got neighbors that have neighboring parcels with a 10-year, 20-year, 50-year fence, and that boundary line becomes the boundary line after the... I have a question, though. In this case, I drew myself a map because I wasn't quite sure how things were. There was a three-year period of time that Hubble owned both pieces of property. Let's say he pulled up the fence he smoothed over the road and made it look like a golf course from, from the north to the south, from both the 80 acres, I think, and the 60 acres, 100% clean. Then he sells two different owners. What's that look like? Interesting question and different facts, and again, why I think it's good to give it a fact by fact. Fact. I'm interested in the Chief Justice's hypothetical. I think it's a good one. What would your answer be? And it just speaks to the same hypothetical that you gave of 100 years ago there was a fence. Do you see? There has to be some circumstances. You don't have boundary by acquiescence where, it, 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 where the situation in some respect has ceased to exist anymore, right? Yeah. That it's a fact by fact uh, basis or a factual scenario for the court to determine. In other words, not necessarily a black and white, black letter, this is it every single time rule because you have to be able to give the court the opportunity to review the facts. Imagine, I got another situation for you. Let's say that the fence was still there, the road is still there, um, owned like they originally were, I think the handlings owed the 80, owned the 80 acres and the Sims owned the 60. And it sounds like they were the ones that kind of set the understanding that I'll take care of the property north of the fence, you do south of the fence. 
and let's say they all died in the same car crash. Nobody ever knew that they were doing this pretend line. And yet in their minds, they knew it was not the real line. They just agreed, hey, my mower's out, I'm just gonna do it. How, how would that ever, how do we start doing the evidentiary work to figure out down the road um, other than what's actually in the records? Isn't this gonna create potential problems in more than just our scenarios? By allowing for properties that have been joined to later subsequently still maintain the boundary of acquiescence, is that what you're saying? Is that going to create problems? I, I don't think so, but I want to step back just a little bit because we can think of fact scenarios on both sides that are going to make it obvious for either answer. And, and that's why I think it's very important that we maintain the ability to let the trial court hear the facts and make determinations as to what makes sense. In this case, it makes sense because they did recognize that fence for a period of 25, 30 years as the boundary. They built... You know, I, I agree with your point. The trial courts need to apply common sense, but also you want to have clear rules because it's a, a, a concept of property law. I mean, during that whole time where it was the, the predecessors, the two families, I forgot their names to the remarks in Sundance, um, they could have, any, either one of them could have gone to court and, and established the boundary, got a decree, established the boundary by acquiescence and thereby made it a record to anybody who later sought to buy the property. There'd be no question about it. So, so you know, the common ownership is kind of a bright line rule and it's based on the, and it, and it has some support in the statute, doesn't it? Because the whole idea of boundary by acquiescence is two separate property owners recognizing a boundary. So you know, the, the people that advocate for that doctrine, that common ownership rule, the courts that have adopted it, the treatises that adopted it says, well, you don't have two common ownership, two, uh, two separate owners in that circumstance. Separate owners for a period of more than 10 years that created a, a visual boundary. In all those other cases, you did too, and they say, well, that, but, but at that point, the boundary, if it hasn't been established of, you know, record in some way by going to court or otherwise, it ceases to be a, a boundary by acquiescence. That's what those cases say. I was talking when Mr. Grothu was up here, though, in the Vaught case, we said after 10 years it, it occurs and it happens. It's, it's a general statement of the law, and that's accurate as a general statement of the law. Obviously, we didn't decide this case in Vaught. But I agree with that. And so, again, Looking at the factual circumstances of this case, here's, here's the decision you guys are going to make if you say, look, we're gonna destroy this boundary line. We've got two buildings that were erected in reliance on this fence that has been there for 25 years that the neighbors agreed this is our boundary. It's not as though the grid from the GIS map is shot out on everybody's field and they can look out to see if the boundary. So <clears throat> I remember, <clears throat> remember something from law school Dean Hines said. Uh, it's very dangerous to look at out-of-state cases regarding Iowa property because our property laws are very different than a lot of other states for different reasons. So we're a primarily agricultural state. You have landowners who may own huge amounts of land and they may lease it to tenant farmers. So it doesn't matter at all if we live in a state where somebody may own 1,600 acres or 6,400 acres and still treats them and the boundaries are still significant and important because you have tenant farmers who might be farming different parcels within all from a common owner and you would have different tenant farmers. It seems to me like that could be something that happens in Iowa quite frequently where you have a common owner of multiple parcels that are joining, but you have different tenant farmers. And should those boundaries be destroyed at that point? It seems, that seems problematic. And actually it seems like a pretty common fact pattern in an agricultural state. And I would be a little bit reluctant to say, if you have multiple tenant farmers, you start losing all the boundaries to your properties. I would say agree with you 100%. And you know, the, the tenure fence rule, if there's any law that farmers in Iowa know, it's the 10-year fence rule. Everybody knows and understands that rule. And it makes... 
applying that or following up on that. The, the Vaughts um, bought the other side of that um, berm. They bought, now have common ownership. Uh, they decide they're going to move the berm and sell it to somebody else. Can a later, can somebody else come back and say no for over 10 years, that berm was there, that's the new boundary? You're stuck with that. Or once you buy both sides, you can do what, whatever you want with it. I think similar in, in, in question to the kind of the hypotheticals that were given, and again, why I think it's so important we give the trial court the ability to hear the facts and make a common sense decision. And we can do that by saying we're not going to automatically destroy these boundaries by acquiescence if there's joinder of title. In other words, the trial court, if you guys say there will never be a boundary by acquiescence if there was joinder of title, then the trial court has no discretion or ability to hear the facts and make a decision. And that's, that's good. All times though, like the, the trial court should be making these determinations based on common sense and, and, and sort of the facts of the particular case. And that I find that very troublesome because as, as Justice Mansfield said, don't we really need to know uh, where the property lines are before the, the case, um, before there's a trial and all those kinds of things? We do, and I think our, our statute gives us that mechanism when it says that when the neighboring owners have acquiesced in a boundary for 10 or more years, then that's the boundary line. I mean, I agree with that, though there are, are certainly circumstances that one can imagine that that doesn't make sense to. To the present time that the 10 years has some connection to some recent period? Uh, of what the what the what the verb tense of 650.14 seems to suggest I, it's been a long time since I was in language arts but I did follow your your have had versus had I think <laughs> so ha, have had versus had and, and it's an interesting question I understand what you're saying basically are you saying uh, or you're asking does the statute contemplate that at the present moment that the parties are are viewing or are understanding this to be the 10-year uh, boundary line. <clears throat> I think the Ollinger case speaks to that to some extent, where it says just because somebody goes out and does something maybe adverse or different or gets a survey doesn't necessarily repudiate or erase what's been done and what has been agreed upon for 10, 20, 50 years. Similar in this case, the fact pattern is such that for a very long period of time, the parties understood this to be uh, the boundary line. At some point, somebody's going to have a different understanding or it's never going to be before the court. And so if you're, if you're contemplating it to mean it has to be up until the moment everybody goes to court, there's lots of scenarios where that's not gonna happen no, because- I, I would agree with that. I mean, and that's what, the, that's what, we've said that, that you can't sort of repudiate the boundary for a few years, you know, fight it for a few years, go to court and say, well, there's, you know, there's not a, bound, a boundary by acquiescence. But, you know, it, it does seem like this, the common ownership is a clear demarcation that's been in, in all the cases elsewhere and, and that is supported by the logic of, of the Iowa statute as well, if we look at the tents that, that it, it, would, um, it would require you to start over, why not? I, I think again, if you look at the dissent in the Colorado case, that really hits it, nails it on the head. I mean, I understand that's in Colorado, that's not Iowa law, but I think it explains it probably better than I could up here. Um, you know, they, they relied some on the doctrine of merger, which I think is totally misplaced. I think that has to do only with easements. This isn't an easement case. There's not a dominant and servient in a state. Uh, these are, are two equal uh, pieces of real estate. That, Days. I mean, that was pretty, pretty short. Not three years like here. I understand. And and you know, as you talk about these, you know, various fact scenarios, you know, the code does contemplate a, a mechanism for the parties to to draw a new boundary line. Uh, Six fifty point seventeen provides if the parties agree this, that there should be a different boundary line, they can do that. Additionally, theoretically, you know, in the I've seen I've gone over. Can I finish? 
a golf course example here where, you know, they plow out the fields and then create um, a golf course and it's there for whatever many number of years. Theoretically, if 10 years pass, you could create a new boundary line with your neighbors or somewhere else. And so, uh, you know, the, the biggest point I think to make is, uh, number one, I think our statutory scheme and our prior case law answers this question. But number two, I think we need to be very careful about not making uh, a black letter law that is going to take away the trial court's ability to make these decisions based upon common sense and the facts as they see it at the time uh, the court is deciding these actions. One question. So the conveyance from the Hubbles to the southern property, the run marks, was in April of 2017. Is that right? I believe that's correct. Conveyance to Sundance was in September of 2018. Is that right? That's correct, yes. Between 2017 and 2018, what is the record on what the parties believe that the boundaries were when they were in separate ownership for that year and a half? When the, when the Remarks owned one side and, the Sun, and Sundance owned the other side? Um, Maybe I'm getting this wrong. Hubbles. Hubbles. In fact, I mean, the, the, the record is, is pretty interesting as far as Mr. Hubble's testimony, but it, it's, I think, very clear that maybe he didn't claim to know where the legal boundary was, but he certainly treated the fence as the boundary and I think represented the fence as the boundary both. Months before he sold to Sundance, the common grantor treated that fence line as the boundary. Okay. It's a question. I thought his testimony was he got up there and said, I don't care. I didn't I didn't care about any boundary. I, you know, I, I mean, is it wasn't that his testimony when he he owned it? Witness, I think Mr. Carpenter did an excellent job redirecting him and, and having him explain that you, you built this building. You built I think it's the impression uh, I got as well. Um, and that, that, you know, I mean, there were there were probably some things he said that could have helped either side, um, but but he he certainly didn't seem in in on the whole to to have any respect or concern about the boundary while he owned the entire property. Would that be fair? Two structures to straddle the legal boundary line on purpose. I don't think the common ownership. Yeah, he was leasing. He was leasing it and. Correct, to some extent correct, yes. I think one of them was built maybe during. You may not have known what the legal line was. Because there was a fence that everybody treated as the legal line, but I agree. Thank you. Justices, I, uh, I'm not the smartest person in the world, but if you, if you talk to me long enough, I'll catch on. So uh, I do understand uh, uh, your, um, uh, Justice, your uh, specific reference to the statute and a statutory interpretation that does work here by uh, the uh, language saying, if it is found that the boundaries and corners alleged to have been recognized, and have been so recognized in acquiescence, acquiesced in, I think you can get a solution that works here. When Mr. Remark comes to the court and asks for a boundary by acquiescence, you look at what is going on for him and whether he has acquiesced or his predecessors in title have acquiesced for a period of 10 years, whether those have been recognized by him and predecessors. Uh, um, right, and, th and, th and that's where I was going with my very long-winded uh, question there. But I, I, I want to ask a question sort of on that subject that, that um, uh, opposing counsel raises, which is, sure, sure, if, if, if Mr. Hubble had treated that fence line as the boundary line for the time that he had it, does that indicate that there's some ongoing uh, 
uh, acknowledgement or recognition of that fence line as the actual property line. You're saying that assuming that that were true? Here, here we have a common owner. Let's say that that common owner also, and I get that his testimony is a little bit murky, but let's say that he testified, yes, I treated that line as the boundary line also. Does that matter? Well, no, I don't think it does because once he owned, once he owned both properties, um, I think that the, the thought in the other jurisdiction is once you own both properties, you don't have an internal boundary within the property that separates the, your property from yourself. You can do whatever you want. Uh, cases, especially the Colorado case, that try and um, equate this to an easement and say that it merges and it just disappears. An easement does disappear when you have common ownership. The boundary does not disappear. There still is a boundary between those two pieces of property. It becomes important if, um, say, there's another landlocked piece of property that you have to go through and you need to have boundaries. I mean, the, the boundary still exists. So why isn't the Colorado descent closer to what um, what we have said in our prior cases about boundary by acquiescence. Your Honor, I, I'm going to respectfully disagree with you. Uh, what the court did is the court said that when you have common ownership, the boundary loses its legal significance. And then later, an al analogized it. That's true. It, the, there very much is still, it might lose its practical significance, but it's still very much, there's still a boundary there as opposed to an easement that actually does disappear. Okay, uh, uh, but I would still, I would, I would still uh, argue that um, under our statute, 650.14, under the reading that I am urging, that you look uh, at, uh, uh, at that person uh, at that time and whether it has been uh, acquiesced in for that time, 10-year period going back by him and, and additional owners. The at 10 years, is that what you're saying? So, because if it's interrupted by common ownership, it's my, I mean, in Iowa, you can do anything that you want with property. Is it burdened into perpetuity by uh, uh, unwritten, not of record, agreements by other people, how to treat a line totally within your property, whether it be a, a, a crop residue line, a, a, um, a fence line, a tree line. Uh, my argument would be when there's common ownership, we want to encourage alienability of, of real estate and to do what you want with your real estate. When you buy it, you own it all and all the rights with it, all the sticks, you can do what you want. And I absolutely agree with that. And I would say that Mr. Hubble could have moved that boundary. So to the chief's um, hypothetical, he could have removed that boundary. And then I think, then you don't have a boundary even to bring the statute into play. If he- With all due respect, upon buying it from mis mishandling, he did remove that fence all throughout there. Now there's a berm there and there may be different field residues that's there. Um, how far does he have to go? He did remove the fence and that hadn't been there since 2010. Okay, he removed it before he owned it, didn't he? Yeah, yeah, he did, and then he put it back in. So he didn't do that as a common owner, is my point. I mean, I think if the boundary was completely removed, as in you put a golf course over it, maybe you have a different story. But in this case, the boundary is still there. Are you disputing that the, that's it, an identifiable boundary? Yeah, it's... The fence that the fence was was taken out in 2010. Be common ownership. So that's a whole different argument related to common ownership, then, right? I, I mean, he never put it. He never put it in. Uh, he took it out in like 2004. Uh, uh, right, but under that argument, you don't even need to rely on common ownership. You just say there's no boundary agreed upon, which is a different argument, well, I think. Just to clarify the record, if I could. So he he removed the fence when he became the tenant of the whole thing, right? And and then later when he was common owner, I did review my notes. He did testify. He didn't care what the boundary was, and and you know, I mean the issue. 
<laughs> I mean, we're bound, the word boundary is, is sort of ambiguous because the whole purpose of the case is to, to, of the case is to determine what the true actual legal boundary is at this point. Um, I look at this fax as, as a, a person who owned it for 22 years, built a, built a property, then encroached upon a section line. We shouldn't infer, as the trial court and the Court of Appeals did, that that, in that, that, in that there was that encroachment over that section line, that he automatically agreed to some supposed fence 30 feet to the north. Um, it, it was an encroachment, yes. Uh, but uh, is this clock running faster for me than other? other? <laughs> no. Rolled and you figured it out. The time starts to go up, but as long as we're asking questions, there's no end of the day. So I'll let you finish the answer to the most recent question and then wrap up unless someone else asks you a question. I think, uh, 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 Your Honor, uh, and getting back to the base uh, argument that you made, I believe that that it, it makes sense and is fair looking at 650.14 that someone is coming to the court and asking that a boundary by, be established by acquiescence. Uh, it, you have to look at the time period that it has been with this person and uh, succeeding owners in the, in the past up to 10 years. Um, and, um, and when one person owns it on both sides, they don't have an internal boundary as against themselves. Um, so thank you very much. A nightmare of a lawyer the night before oral arguments to imagine the clock growing in time. <laughs> so we appreciate your patience. Um, the case of Sundance Land Company versus Remark is hereby submitted and the court will take a morning recess.